you see it. And we are live. Hi. All right. Okay, everybody, this is Dr. Shelley Lenz, and I'm doing one of my favorite things that I am doing for my campaign. I can continue afterward, and that is homegrown stories, where we really just highlight um, just the amazing people that North Dakota has. And so since this is for all of the people that are watching uh, the Facebook Live, uh, you get a chance to see why um, everybody's so dedicated to North Dakota and North Dakota people. So today I have Heidi. And Heidi, this is um, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And so Heidi, um, so first of all, is your last name your married name right now? Or is that yes. your original yep. name? Domeyer. Yep. My maiden Dohmeyer. name is Yes, oh. Fikert. Yep. Fikert. Okay, because I, I wasn't sure about that. So yep. help Heidi Dolmeyer. Um, so if you could tell us then as Heidi Fikert where you grew up and about your family history. Sure, yeah, absolutely. I grew up in a really tiny town in the center of North Dakota called Goodrich. Uh, it's kind of south of Harvey. Most people kind of know at least where Harvey is. So it's a town of about 120 people. Um, my parents, my mom was the postmaster in town, and then now after her retirement is now the mayor. Um, I, yeah, she didn't take retirement too long. Yeah, she she's like, I'm, I got to find something else. So now she's currently the mayor, and uh, my dad is a third generation well driller. So my grandfather, my great grandfather, and so on, we're all uh, water well drillers. Um, so and I have two si two sisters, an older sister Laura and a younger sister Rebecca. Um, yeah, so that's kind of where I grew up. I went K through 12 at Goodrich High School or Goodrich Public School. Um, graduated from there, and um, yeah, it's a great little town. Yeah. So how many people live in that town? About 120. 120. So yeah. that's weird to a lot of people outside of North Dakota. Very common here. Um, so so first of all, tell me, is your are you Norwegian then? Like is your so my grandmother's side is German from Russia, which is a very like has a lot of um, um, organized groups um, in in North Dakota. So they were of German heritage, uh, moved to Russia um, for some land, and then later uh, fled Russia to the United States. Yep, uh, as part of the Homestead Act. Yep. So there's actually a lot of Germans from Russians um, that are in North Dakota and South Dakota, and, and I think in Iowa. So yeah. So that side, um, my mom's side is more uh, English. We have some Irish things like mm -hmm. that. So okay. but yeah, that, that primarily that German from Russia and then yeah, English. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Yeah. So you grew up in a town of 120 people with a, a postmaster for your mom and a well driller for your dad. So tell us what it's like growing up in a town of 120 people. What did you do? <sighs> <laughs> yeah, so in a town of 120 people, you know, you kind of know everyone, right? <laughs> so, and everyone knows you, which can be a really great thing, right? So as yeah. a kid, you know, you really interact with so many different people of so many, you know, variety of ages and, and backgrounds. Um, so it's really wonderful in that sense. Um, the towns and communities of that size are just so supportive, right? Yeah. They, you know, they're supportive of the school and supportive of athletics and supportive of their church organizations. And um, so, you know, as a community, we really saw people kind of pull together and help one another in times of hardship. Um, and yeah, you just really get that that community feel all the time. So it's a it's a really special thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is uh, that is so true, and it's like so deep in you that it, it just because we're going to talk Absolutely. about what you've done recently. And I think that upbringing is what has created right. the thing that we're going to talk about in a little bit. But before we get to that, right. so interestingly, um, I want you to talk about your current profession. Sure. What was your path to getting there, knowing that that would be your vocation? Because it's sort of, I was a little taken yeah. back when I <laughs> yeah. and, and realized, you know, what you do yeah. for a living. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So after I graduated from high school in Goodrich, I went to Mabel State University and I majored in computer information systems with a business administration minor. Um, I also played um, women's basketball for Mabel State. Um, so I went there and I knew that I either kind of wanted to go into computers or I wanted to go into teaching. Um, and, you know, I really think I just gravitated towards the, the computer industry because I'm a very hands-on learner. And I think, you know, I really like solving problems and I like challenges and things like that. And I thought, you know, this is, gonna, this is a really good fit for me. It allows me to kind of, you know, do a lot of different things and be on the move and, um, but still get that face-to-face -face customer experience that I, you know, learned in a small town, right? I'm a total yeah. talker. I love to talk to people from the time I was a baby all the way till now, right? Yeah. Um, so, uh, so <laughs> that kind of just fit in, right? You really get to talk to people and work with people, but at the same time, you're hands-on, you're a problem solver, right? 
Right. So when I graduated from there, I started my first job in the IT industry at Border States Electric, and I kind of started on their help desk and then uh, spent 10 years there, the majority oh. of time managing their IT services department. Okay. Yep. And then uh, the last six years, I've been at Microsoft as a customer success account manager. So I work with customers okay. and align their IT strategies to Microsoft support and services and really just kind of help them through whatever blockers or challenges they may have in their IT experience. And right. um, yeah, so it's, it was just a, the industry was just a great fit for me personally. Yeah, it sounds like, I mean, definitely. And so do you have to be, I don't know much about your profession, but do you right. have to be good at like math and science or is it more just good at everything? Yeah, like, so there's I mean, a, a large variety of roles, you know, in the IT industry. So there, you know, are roles that would be more math and science heavy, you know, like analytics and, you know, development okay. and things like that, where you're really working kind of in depth with code or with, uh, you know, data and things like that. And then there's swings all the way to the other side of people who, you know, are really just customer focused and really just okay. have the ability to really kind of align with people and build relationships with people. So it really kind of depends on what you think your strengths are to kind of align to the best area. Okay. Okay. So that helps. Like, again, I don't understand the profession, but I think that's right. so amazing because you don't hear very many women, Yeah. You know, women from small towns and right. that's a misconception that we some of us have is that like you have right. to be like a superstar at math or something like that but right and you definitely don't have to you know yeah. and that's what we're kind of trying to tell young women is that um although right now it may seem like it's a very male dominated industry um you know there's there's definitely this is definitely a place for women right and okay. um women to really excel in the it industry right um so so it's definitely definitely something we try to communicate to our younger generations yeah, and so I really want to kind of expand on that a little bit. Sure. Because, again, I was so taken aback by uh, so right. much about you, because it doesn't seem um, common to have females in your profession, as you said. Right. It sounds like it's getting better. It's right. changing, right? And it is. What are the barriers? Is it kind of misconceptions like, oh, you have to be just a superstar at math, you know, and like we we don't right. understand the profession, or what were the barriers that your that helped you? that you're breaking down to help and then what that right. you faced getting into it. Right, you know, I think for me, uh, I've always been a pretty confident person. So, you know, especially if anyone were to challenge, you know, whether or not they felt that I should or shouldn't be someplace. Yeah. <laughs> so for yeah. me, you know, it was easy to kind of go up against those barriers and, and feel confident about um, my place uh, in that industry and in those organizations. Yeah. Um, but for younger girls, so I volunteer for the UCode Girls, which is a, a STEM related uh, youth development pro program. Um, also, the DigiGirls um, organization, which is a spinoff from Microsoft. Um, and what we kind of hear from some of those young women is, you know, there isn't a whole lot of women role models sometimes that are kind of yeah. presented to them in the industry. So sometimes they think, well, maybe it isn't for me or maybe, you know, maybe this isn't something that a lot of women do. Um, or they'll go into, you know, like tech clubs and things like that. And they'll be like, well, I'm the only girl and it's 40 boys, you know, like, uh, you know, right. maybe it's their comfort level with that or, right. you know, kind of questioning you know, whether or not um, they feel that it's a fit for them. Right. So in these organizations, we truly try to communicate to girls, you know, this is totally a place for you. Right. We need women minds in all industries. Right. We need women to um, to excel, especially in the IT industry. Right. Yes. Um, there's so many opportunities for women and so many opportunities for women to excel to a high level um, in the IT you know, industry. Yeah. OK, that makes sense. Like uh, I can I could see me not wanting to go into a club as what with a bunch of boys and being the only girl. I mean, that would be just like a very like right. obvious thing that. Yeah. So, so. Right. And if you really have a passion for something and you're interested in it, you know, we want girls to continue to pursue that, whether or not they're the only girl in the room or, you know, right. one of many women in the room. Right. Yeah. And so what kind of things do you, how do you develop that confidence in that? Like, is it a, an adult child one-on-one -on -one mentorship that you're doing or? So like in the Yuko girls and Digit girls, um, there's, there's several different ways that we've communicated to youth and that in some cases it's been a mentorship opportunity in other okay. cases it's been exposure to female leadership in all different kinds of industries. Like a Yuko girl, they brought in people from NASA, they brought in people from, you know, women leaders who run drone companies and oh. development companies and all sorts of really, really amazing, cool organizations. Um, but just letting people, you know, letting the girls kind of see like, oh, that would be a really cool job or, you know, um, this is how they took this path to get there, you know, yeah. um, which kind of just gives them some stepping stones to say, you know, I really think that this is something I want to pursue further because it could be a fit for me. 
Well, that's, that's your, your small town, like, <laughs> yeah. unity, like talent yeah. coming through. Okay. So you are this amazing professional woman. You, you came from an amazing family, but that's not all you are. You actually have your own family. So I why do. You talk a little bit about your own family. Right. So I met my husband at Mayville State while we were both going to college. He's originally okay. from Mayville. Yep. And we met at Mayville State and uh, after graduation got married. Um, Wait, how and... did you meet him? Like, how, when, do you remember when you first laid eyes on him? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, Mayville was a small college as well, especially at that time. So you kind of, again, kind of know, you know, a lot of people or a lot of people are in similar circles and stuff. So I had met him before. And then um, we had a lot of computer classes together because he was oh, okay. also going to be a computer information systems uh, major with a, he had a minor in development. Um, so just the more and more we kind of, you know, saw each other in classes and things like that. Yeah. Just kind of fostered into a relationship and, okay. and then yeah. upon graduation, yeah, we got married a year after graduation. So young and, yeah. um, and so he's a senior developer for NAU country insurance. Um, okay. and then, yeah. And then we had our boys in 2008 and 2010. So we currently have a sixth grader and a fourth grader at the central cast school here in town. Wow. That yeah. is a cool hand. So now how does being a parent affect how you approach technology? So did it change once you became like a parent and a family and like how you approach things or how you dealt with your career? Like, Oh, definitely. You know, I think, I think you really, when you become a parent, uh, especially a mother um, and you're a working professional, you really have to look for that family work-life balance, right? Yeah. It's really important to, you know, feel like you're excelling at your job, but still, you know, being the type of mother that you want to be right to your children. Um, from a technology perspective, I think you kind of learn to multitask very quickly and you look at technology as a way to kind of uh, help you be more efficient in your day-to-day -day life. So I definitely looked at, you know, technology to say, you know, how could we kind of streamline things and you know so that when we want to have family time we have family time you know we're not you know doing errands or doing other tasks right so yeah. I think it's definitely fit in that way I also think as a mother you look at you look at things differently um, when it comes to your children or other people's children right you think about um, you know how you are as a mother to them and, and you see gaps and things in the community and uh, gaps and stuff where you kind of realize you know how grateful you are um, as, as a person to have the family life you have, et cetera, or are able to provide for your child. And I think that kind of, you know, it just gets deeper and broader uh, the older your children get. And that brings me to yeah. your app. So yes. this, that, that is a perfect like introduction. Like, yeah. um, again, you're just so compassionate. Like I always think about computer people as like super nerdy and like, just like <laughs> yeah. robots. That's a common but, misconception. Yeah. I know, but you're so compassionate and loving and caring and profound. Tell us about your app and um, how that works right. with your whole way of being. Yeah, I'll take you a little bit like back. Like you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I'll take you back to the beginning a little bit. So our boys attend Central Cass uh, School in Castleton. And last year, we really started hearing some really heartbreaking stories um, about some students that were coming to school without their basic needs met. And um, I said, you know, I think if the community knew that we had this kind of need and we provided a platform for them to give that they would really blow us away. And they have. So from that, we created the Central Cast Treehouse, which is an on-campus pantry, pantry at the uh, Castleton School. And it provides um, hygiene and shelf-stable food, school supplies, holiday wear, winter gear, uh, clothing for pre-K through 12th grade, et cetera. Um, and the, the pantry concept isn't new. There's a lot of schools that do that. But with our technology background, we said, wouldn't it be really amazing if we created a way to empower our middle school and high school students to tell us about any physical, mental, or social need they may be having? Let's right. put technology in their hands, bring all of these amazing organizations together and let's have the kids start telling us what they really need and how we can help them right so my husband is a developer and i've been in it for 16 years as well and so we created an app uh, available on ios and android primarily right now it's for the central cast school but we're looking to expand that to the state level mm -hmm. and so students on there can um can order things out of the pantry just like an amazon cart they can order what they need um, it's an anonymous platform so we said from the beginning you know we don't want to know who we're serving but we're going to leverage the confidentiality that the school already has with students. Yeah. Can so, I, can I, just, can yeah, I just expand on that just a little bit? Sure. Because you're coming from a small town, you right. understand how parents feel about, pro like, can you kind of expand on how important that is? Right. Uh, 
you know, your privacy and the anonym, anonymity right. and all that other stuff. Yeah. So coming from a small, lot of people get worried about. <laughs> right. Yeah. So coming from a small community um, and then also living in a small community now, you know, we understand um, that even well-intended people sometimes share information and um, we wanted to make sure that we were providing privacy and anonymity to the students so that they never didn't have to feel any shame or stigma for asking for help, whether that be physically, mentally, or socially, right? We wanted to make sure that we could partner with the community, but leverage the confidentiality that our school already has in place through its teachers and administrators. Yeah, and then so that's kind of how we developed the app to be anonymous, right? So from the beginning, uh, no board member, uh, community member, or volunteer ever sees any information regarding any student. Um, and the student actually only has to provide a lunch number um, if they want to order something from the pantry. Um, so and that's just to make sure that we can put it in the correct locker. So yeah, and I think it's so it gives an opportunity for the community to really give back and support our teachers and support our students and support our admins, but at the same time, um, keeps it confidential so that those people who are recipients can really feel comfortable about getting the items that they need without any kind of fear or shame or stigma. Yeah. So do you want to walk through how a student might do that? Let's say, um, yeah. I, you know, go ahead. Yeah, sure. So um, the app can be used by a teacher or a student. So, okay. um, if a teacher identifies a need and sees maybe that a student is struggling in, in any kind of way, they can order something, it'll automatically be hung in their locker. Um, if a student um, would like to request something, they can either do it anonymously, where they go through almost like an Amazon cart, uh, pick out the items that they need, and it's hung in their locker during class time so nobody sees that delivery. Mm -hmm. okay, and then they can also choose to shop in the store if they'd like to actually be present and go into the store um, and try things on or look at things, uh, whether that be before school, after hours, or in a confidential setting during the day. That's just amazing. I just think yeah. it's amazing. Yeah. Right. So go ahead and so go ahead about more of its implementation and everything then. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Must so have to convince like a ton of people, right? Or yes. What was that? How did you get that? I mean, just developing the app itself is an amazing feat. Right. But then you had to get it. You had to get buy-in from you know the teachers and the board the school board right yeah you know we, we needed to see adoption from for from both our teachers and our admins which was very easy you know they love these Good. kids they Good. want to support these children to the you know the greatest extent and that's kind of what we were seeing prior to the app and prior to the treehouse was they were utilizing their own personal finances to meet those basic needs of students mm -hmm. um so you know the buy-in from that was great um they were very excited about it it's more like trying to get the students to understand that that, you know, this is a, this is something that's provided for them, and it doesn't have to be emergency. It doesn't have to be a critical use type pantry. It can be utilized on a day to day, you know, a day to day schedule. So if they need anything at any time, they can request it at any time. No questions asked. That's awesome. That's super awesome. And then, how do the community members? You get all your stuff from the pantry from the community members. From right? there, and from Great Plains Food Bank. Yep. Oh, from the food so, bank. Okay, but yep, you have so. Too, yeah, the clothing. So on our when we first initiated the treehouse, we did just a, a donation night and the community members brought us everything. You okay. know, they brought us food, they brought us clothing, they brought us winter boots, they really brought us everything we needed to kind of get started. Uh, we washed all the clothing, organized everything, and then yeah, put it in a space. So the, the actual physical pantries in the elementary wing of the Central Cat School, and we did that on purpose to keep it away from the high school. So if somebody wanted to shop, they didn't feel, you know, that someone might see them in there um, and then also be in close proximity to the elementary teachers okay yeah yeah and then you did say so this has been working beautifully in in in, Ca in castleton yes uh, and so you are now looking to bring this to us because we could really certainly use this out in western north dakota right yeah right? you uh, know Coming from such a small community of 120 people, we realized that a single source technology solution is the only way to scale a model like this for your really small rural schools and your really large, you know, even high school centers in Fargo or Bismarck or Dickinson, right? That gives us an opportunity to allow students to tell us specifically what they need, regardless of what size school they're in or what their circumstances may be, right? So we we were solving a, solving a problem in Central Cast, but then in addition to that, um, creating this as a proof of concept that we're 
taking to the state of North Dakota and asking them to make this an education platform standard. Because on top of the pantry work, there's also a mental health component. And as part of the mental health component, they can tell us about, uh, students can tell us about a mental health emergency. They can schedule time with a counselor. They can talk and text with First Link. Um, they can tell us if they're worried about a friend. So we're really taking those mental health support services and putting it right into a student's hands. So they can tell us specifically, I'm yeah. struggling. My friend is struggling. How do we get them help, right? How do we align people in, in an anonymous way to make sure that we're aligning youth support services and suicide prevention to students at, all across the state? That's, that's so beautiful. And just, yeah. can you, a lot of people don't know what first link is. Can you just, right. it's like an emergency, like. Right. right. Yep. Yep. So 911, people are familiar with 911 for any kind of physical emergency. First link is 211. Um, and that's available for any kind of mental health emergency. Yep. So suicide prevention, um, mental health support. Um, it also has um, additional services for addiction, both for family support and then also for people who may be suffering from addiction. Um, and they actually have a youth component. Um, so youth can talk and text with them as well anonymously, even if it's not an emergency. And it's just someone to listen. So they can, you know, they can tell them they had a great day or they can tell them you know i'm really struggling with the following things and these people are trained in you know 24 by 7 um youth mental health support and suicide so prevention to an adult or yeah. a trained, an adult a trained yep a trained oh. yep a trained person That's through beautiful. first length yeah yeah yep yeah. so yeah. there's emergency services yep yeah. and then there's also you know those talk and text features that really allow students to just kind of communicate with someone about what's going on in their life and it's anonymous um, and it's just there to help, just someone to listen. Yeah. So I just, uh, it's just such a great app and it just hits so many, but this is, this is North Dakota, you know, that yes. community-based practical yep. problem solving that, that hits several, you know, right. you to solve a problem. There you go. <laughs> so, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And so, um, so this is part of your comprehensive approach to uh, strengthening your communities because you're so community-based. Right. Are there other services, um, uh, that you partner with to provide kind of some of those community things? Yeah, so, right. So we have lots of partnerships um, that, you know, there's so many amazing people in the state doing so many amazing things, right? So we wanted to highlight the amazing work that other people are doing, but pull it pull it together to a single source technology solution for our, our youth, right? Yeah. Um, so we align with uh, Essentials Community Fund. We align with First Link, uh, Great Plains Food Bank, the Rural Cast Emergency Food Pantry, uh, Cass Hope, which is a youth um, mental health and suicide prevention group in town here. Uh, Fifth Quarter, which is a grant that Castleton had received um, to kind of provide a positive social experiences for our students so that they stay out of trouble and make good positive decisions. Yeah. Um, yeah, and the list goes on and on. I mean, we have so many amazing organizations that um, help us like Imagine Thriving, um, yeah, which is also youth mental health support. Um, yeah, so anyone and everyone, like even like the Knights of Columbus provide us stuff. Oh. You know, there's organizations that reach out and say, you know, how can we help or what could we provide mm -hmm. or supplement, yeah. you know, that would be beneficial or helpful. Um, so yeah, just, yeah, we have just a lot of really wonderful people doing a lot of wonderful things. Um, and this is just kind of pulling them together for our students. Yeah. That, that's beautiful. And so like, how has COVID, especially now that school's on, how has right. COVID uh, affected the need from the community and your ability to provide the services? Right, so Castleton right now is five days a week in person um, with a lot of safety and, and you know, uh, procedures and, and stuff in place. Um, so right now we are providing that to the locker, but last spring, what we were doing was uh, the school was providing meals to um, anyone from zero age to age 18 and then um, um, additional, additional services to additional people in the community as well, I think to age 25. Um, so we were just kind of supplementing that. Yeah. So providing, you know, additional snacks and things or trying to align to where we would align either to a drop off location, um, which is where people were picking up food from the school or, um, you know, actually take it to their address if they wanted to share or communicate that information to us. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's great. So yeah. I, I just, again, I just wanted to just let people know, like, again, I think of app, apps and stuff as like, Tech, but there's so <laughs> yeah. much heart and caring and love and and community efforts into that. So it really shines through. Thank so you. Um, what is your, okay, other than that app, which is my favorite app now, Thank <laughs> you. what's your favorite app other than that app? 
like as oh, a happy person. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Microsoft to-do list. Oh, so really? A, yeah. <laughs> as a busy uh, mom and professional and founder of the Treehouse, uh, I kind of live and die by my to-do list. You okay. know, we use it for absolutely everything. Uh, Amazon, of course, uh, my Target app, <laughs> all of those <laughs> things. Um, additionally, I listen to a lot of audiobooks on Overdrive or Libby, which is through this, the uh, State Library, which is awesome. Oh, um, wait, yeah. What? Yeah, it's Libby or Overdrive, and you can align, if you, you have a library card anywhere in the state, you can align to the North Dakota Digital Consortium, and you can listen to any book for free or do ebooks, um, and it's all free content for you. Uh, amazing. Yeah. So I listen to a lot of books on Overdrive. Um, I try and stay up on a lot of tech stuff. And, yeah. You know, so I listen to some nerdy tech podcasts and things like that. But um, yeah, but I'd have to say my to-do list. So my husband and I share it and we have lists and lists and lists, you know, <laughs> lists, and lists. Yeah, no, lists, of lists of lists, you know, and that just helps me stay organized and helps me, you know, kind of prioritize what I'd like to accomplish each day. Well, you get it all done. I mean, <laughs> yeah. it's really amazing. Oh, um, okay. You. So Ben, this is my favorite question I always ask of okay. homegrown stories people. What is your favorite thing about North Dakota? The mountains. Just kidding. Uh, okay. <laughs> the Kildare Mountains? <laughs> yeah. Just That's kidding. Hilarious. Yeah. Um, I'd have to say the sense of community. You know, yeah. like we talk about North Dakota nice or Minnesota nice, um, but that is really a real thing. You know, people really watch out for each other. They really rally when someone is struggling or has a hardship, right? Yeah. Um, and I really love that about North Dakota, that people really pull together um, when they need to and um, really help one another, right? They help each other through some of the hardest, you know, experiences of their life. And um, they provide meals and they mow their lawn and, you yeah. know, clear snow for them and do a lot of wonderful things for other people that they're not asked to do, they just choose to do. And I think, you know, the world is a much better place um, for that, right? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a much better place for people to see need in others and to fill that need. So that's what I love about North Dakota. Yeah. I do too. <laughs> and, and you are a shining example of oh, thank you. That culture into the modernity. And, uh, and um, I'm just so glad you're a North Dakota, fellow North Dakotan. And I just, yeah. you. well, thank you so much for, uh, for having me today. I do appreciate the time. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Thanks. Bye. Bye. I forgot.